Good afternoon, everyone, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Welcome to the Game or Die podcast. My name is Ryan Moore, and we're going to be talking about a lot of video games today. Some I played, some I haven't played or uh, am looking forward to, but basically, the way that this podcast works is basically I want to talk about the games that I've been playing, playing on stream and the games that I'm looking forward to, or even the game of the month. So we got a lot of stuff to cover today. And just like the last several weeks, I am doing this live on Twitch and YouTube as well. I do have the chat brought up and I was talking about it last night on stream. I'm not really sure if I want to incorporate chat into the podcast. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not really sure. For the simple fact that when I do these podcasts, I just do it like I'm recording something, like voice acting, and I want to make sure it's as good of quality as possible. So getting interrupted by chat might, you know, kind of throw off my groove a little bit, but I've been doing this a long enough time to where I could change up the format a little bit. And now that I have gotten more of a following with the channel, with more people watching live and actually chatting, I might be able to switch up the formula a little bit. So I'm going to keep an eye on chat. And if you do have questions, maybe I'll do a question and answer at the end of the uh, section, or I might just pause and answer some questions as we go through if they are relevant to the actual conversation. But without that out of the way, let's get into the podcast. So. Let's talk about what I've been playing. And I have basically solidly been playing only on stream for the last three months. It is now in the dead middle of March. And since January, like second or third, (laughs) I've been basically playing every video game possible on streaming, Uh, whether that's through Twitch or YouTube or multi streaming or whatever. But I basically confined all my video game playing to streaming and I'm trying to make it a viable, you know, second gig, you know, type of thing. But I'm having so much fun. It doesn't matter at all because I am conquering and beating and finishing so many video games. So just a little over a month ago, a month and some change on Valentine's Day, Aspire, the Corporation, the you know developer, uh, they released Tomb Raider 1, 2, and 3 Remastered Collection. And I've been really solidly playing those over the course of the last month, and I've been having a blast. I have talked about it on the podcast before, and I'm going to talk about it again just to make sure everyone's kind of caught up on my history of the series and kind of what's been going on. So when the original Tomb Raider came out, I never played it. Uh, My friend Andrew actually had it on uh, PlayStation and he showed it to me and I thought it was super cool. I remember him showing me, dude, check out this level. It's got a dinosaur in it. It's got a T-Rex. And I was like, dude, that's rad. But I never got into it. I didn't own a PlayStation until a little bit later on in its lifespan. I was more of a Nintendo and Sega kid. And I was like, Sony... PlayStation, bah, whatever. (laughs) Little known to me at the time, man, I was dead wrong in some of those uh, presumptions, let's say. So basically what happened was I got the PlayStation a little bit later, so I kind of missed the boat on Tomb Raider 1. It did come out on the PlayStation, PC, and Saturn, but I didn't have any of those systems. Now, we did have a family computer, but it wasn't until the second game in the series, PlayStation or Tomb Raider 2, where I actually got into the series. Uh, we had a you know Windows 95 machine, and it did come with some games, and I was squarely, you know, playing video games on both console and PC at that point in my life. So I was like, oh, man, I want a real another game. And Tomb Raider 2, man, I remember the feel and look of the, you know, the box and the instruction manual. Oh, my gosh. I just remember everything about that game uh, other than the actual levels. I remember some of it. So basically what happened was I started going through and playing that game uh, 
but I didn't really understand any of the beginning stuff. I never played Tomb Raider 1. It wasn't until back in December of 2023, just a few months ago, that I sat down and played through the first couple of levels of Tomb Raider 1, mostly because I was doing a video series called Retro Sember. Every uh, December, I start uh, going back and doing like a nostalgia trip of classic consoles, classic video games. In 2022, I took a look at 8 and 16-bit. In 2023, I took a look at 32-bit. Guess what next year is, or this year, right? Um, So basically, I started doing a video series of every day, I look back at a certain game in that generation of consoles. So obviously, 32-bit is Sony PlayStation. So I was going through Sony PlayStation games and going, which ones do I want to cover? And Tomb Raider was one that stood out as something I do want to kind of take a look at. It doesn't have to be the fact that I played it or not. It's got to have some sort of memory associated with it. I definitely have an associated uh, associated memory of that game. So I went through and I played the first couple of levels of Tomb Raider 1. I was like, all right, cool. And I remember having a really fun time with it and going, you know, there is a new remaster that's going to come out. And so that's what I did. I waited until the remaster came out in February of this year and started kind of just playing it on stream. And over the course of maybe two streams or so, I fell in love with the first game. I was having so much fun. It was rad. Uh, Give me one second. Let's make sure that we... uh, uh, it looks like we lost the sound. Oh, shoot. That's not good. Um, let's let's take a pause here real quick. Okay, so basically what I was talking about before we had a couple audio issues there was Tomb Raider 2. And when I had that game as a kid, I played it on the PC back in 1997. And I definitely remember bits and pieces of it. But for whatever reason, I actually don't remember a whole lot about it. And going through the Tomb Raider 1, 2, and 3 remastered games, it's been a blast. It's been so, so, so much fun. Tomb Raider 1, so far, is definitely my favorite. Because when going through Tomb Raider 1, it covers Egyptian mythology and, um, you know... I'm trying to think of like supernatural type of things. And I've always been really, really into the study of Egyptology. It's been one of my childhood fascinations, whether that was with the mummy movies (laughs) back with Brendan Fraser or the classic Hollywood Studios version. I've always loved Egyptian studies. And so learning that Tomb Raider 1 really dives deep into that. That's kind of really what captured my fascination and love for that game. So as I've been playing through Tomb Raider 1, I just kept diving deeper and deeper. And it doesn't go super in depth into a lot of that stuff, but enough to really, really make me uh, be happy with the game. And then in Tomb Raider 2, I finally kind of went back to the game that I had in 1997 on a Windows 95 PC, and it was just incredible. It was so, so, so much fun. So after that point, now I've moved on to Tomb Raider 3. And that's the one that I have uh, a little bit of memory with. And as we got through the Nevada section, I went, oh, I totally remember this. This is the first time I really went, I remember this part of the game with her camo pants and the loading screen and all that stuff. It was just like, that's right. I remember this game totally. And we'll be playing that game after the podcast in a little bit here. But Tomb Raider 3, I think, is a good combination of Tomb Raider 1 and Tomb Raider 2's mechanics and attributes because Tomb Raider 1, I think the puzzles and the platforming were way, way, way better than Tomb Raider 2. Tomb Raider 2 did a good job of upgrading the combat. There's so much more combat in Tomb Raider 2. It's kind of unbelievable. It's like almost a completely different game. Tomb Raider 2 does feel like a too many cooks in the kitchen type of scenario where 
executive influence of, hey, the first one did good, but what if we made it more action-y? At the time when I was playing through one and two last month, I was saying it kind of reminds me of Alien and Aliens, those two movies, because Alien is a much more psychological thriller. But Aliens, the sequel, is much more of an action based movie. And so that's kind of how I feel with Tomb Raider and Tomb Raider 2. They are both really good, but Tomb Raider 1 holds much more um, sophistication in how hardcore it is doing those few things that it's doing and it's doing it really really well tomb raider 2 kind of opens up and broadens the scope of the game but at the expense of some of the mystery some of the really tight platforming and it kind of gets more into combat encounters and not only that I think the level design in two is actually pretty poor for most of the game, especially in that shipwreck section. (laughs) That shipwreck section was definitely the one that I had a huge, huge issue with. So that all being said, Tomb Raider 3 is kind of a really good combination of Tomb Raider 1 and 2's mechanics and attributes, making it a much more solid balanced experience and i'm you know fairly deep into that game now the levels are expansive they're very very long too with tomb raider 1 and 2 the levels were long but it was more me not learning how the game is played or you know trying to figure out where to go and what to do but with most of the levels in 3 it has definitely become a oh my gosh these are just long levels. Like it took over two hours to finish the last level in London. And it's because you are backtracking very long distances in certain cases. And the platforming, the climbing, the shimming and all that stuff does take its toll a little bit. So even now that I'm firmly probably about at least halfway through Tomb Raider 3, I've completed two full, you know, areas, the jungle, the Indian jungle, which beautiful, awesome levels and the London levels, which are a little bit more industrial, which is cool. Like you're in like a modern day city setting, kind of like in Venice in number two, it is definitely a kind of more crazy style. So that is one of those things that I've been really enjoying for the most part. But uh, there's definitely uh, part of me going, man, I, w- I, I kind of want to just play Tomb Raider 1 again. <laughs> and learning that not only does Tomb Raider 3, because we actually were in London and it did kind of tie back into Egyptology stuff. I did learn that 4, I think it's called The Last Revelation, does go back into more of the Egypt stuff. Uh, studies and i'm really excited about that so they're kind of tying in egypt throughout the series and i really really like that part of it Uh, so now we're in nevada and we'll play a little bit more of that as the podcast comes to an end and i'm really excited i'm i'm really enjoying the platforming i'm enjoying everything about this series it is so 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 much fun so basically uh I'm kind of moving forward with Tomb Raider 3. The cutscenes itself, too, kind of do give a little bit more. That was one of my kind of bigger issues with 1 and 2 is I felt like I had no idea what was going on. It would have been nicer if there was some sort of text or maybe the cutscenes kind of did a little bit more better explaining. But the cutscenes in 3 are much better produced they actually take the time not only to have a little bit of comedy you know for the time you know the mid 90s writing style is definitely there but it does give you a sense of okay laura is doing this thing and these characters are doing that thing like the world is existing outside of laura's perspective which is kind of something that was lacking definitely lacking in one and mostly in two 
there's like four or five cutscenes in two where I couldn't tell you the name of the villain, the uh, name of the MacGuffin, you know, or the plot device or any of that stuff. I have no idea, uh, especially in one, too. Like we got to the last level in one and there was this one cutscene. And I think there's like two other cutscenes that are like maybe a minute each. <laughs> but that last cutscene was really the one where I was just like, they're talking about all these characters and I have no idea who they're talking about because I think I've seen two characters and it was the guys in the plane that had the most dialogue out of all of those. <laughs> oh, no, that was number two. Never mind. Um, I apologize. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of crazy. So I'm really, really, really enjoying Tomb Raider three or the entire series. Uh, one, two and three remaster. That remastered collection is unbelievable. So that is one of the games that I've been really diving deep into. We're going to continue it. We're going to finish that game. We're going to mark it off the list. And then afterwards, what we're going to do is probably dive into Tomb Raider 4 at some point, but I'm not sure if I'm going to go into it right away. It depends on how I feel after Tomb, 3, Tomb Raider 3 is finished. Another game that I've been pouring my hours into is the game of the month for march which is expeditions a mud runner game that title is kind of uh <laughs> i i don't like the title but it's kind of um worn on me a little bit it's is kind of making me go okay sure whatever because i always like talking about the titles in their full length you know if if you're dealing with that but uh, I don't know. <laughs> There's sometimes where I go, that's a really bad title or that's a really good title. Like Halo, the first Halo. Everyone calls it Halo, right? But the real title, and then when you talk to other people who like do YouTube videos or podcasts, they always call it by its full name, Halo Combat Evolved. And I've never called it Halo Combat Evolved. I've always just called it straight up Halo because... Why would you say Combat Evolved other than that's the full title? The subtitle is kind of terrible. Kind of like with Expeditions. Expeditions is a much easier uh, title to say, but when you say Expeditions, a mud runner game, it allows people to understand what type of game it is. And we've been talking about this on the streams over the last couple of uh, times here. The, let me think, the, uh, the genre title like there is no real genre title for this mud runner snow runner spin tires they're all a very 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 specific set of simulation games and so we kind of came to the conclusion over the course of the last several nights of calling it a off-road simulation uh, simulation game and i think that kind of sticks i think that kind of works pretty well i would like a little bit more description than that but Hey, it's not that big of a deal, right? So if you don't know what Expeditions is, it is a Mud Runner game. If you have no idea what Mud Runner or Snow Runner are, let me kind of just briefly go through this because I do talk about this on pretty much almost every stream that has new viewers where they go, what are you playing? There was a game in 2014 that released called Spin Tires. And basically you're a big old Russian truck or several big old Russian trucks. And your goal is to get from point A to point B on this big old map in the middle of the wilderness. And everything is very, very muddy. And you're dealing with very, very heavy machinery, like trucks and stuff like that. And so a lot of what you're doing is just driving from point A to point B, but the mechanics of the game are basically use the transmission and the gears and the certain types of tires and winches to haul equipment and your truck across this big map that is basically covered in mud and rocks and hills and trees. And that's it. <laughs> that's like the entire game. So it was really interesting to be able to, um, kind of see what that game was back in 2014 and go, ooh, I don't know if I'm really wanting to play this. Like, it seems interesting, but at the same time, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stick with it. That seems very, very frustrating. 
So I kind of never really played Spin Tires. Then when Mud Runner, the sequel came out, it was titled Mud Runner, a Spin Tires game. <laughs> so telling you, hey, this is the sequel to this Spin Tires game. We're calling it Mud Runner. And I didn't play that game at all either. It wasn't until the third game in the series, Snow Runner, which came out in 2020, just about four years ago, right at the start of the pandemic. It was unbelievably fun for me. I think what it really did well was tie it all together with missions and objectives and stories. Instead of just saying go from point A to point B and haul stuff, it was a lot of here's a village that you're living in and you are contracted out from different companies or different um you know other places or going exploring. Like it all felt really cohesive, like immersed into this little village. And then there was multiple areas that you can do. Like you start off in Michigan, then you move your way to Alaska and you do all these different various missions for these companies. And you kind of get a feeling of where everything is and what companies need what and all that stuff. And also like you're in a village and it's been flooded, like in Michigan and people are needing your help. You're helping people out. So you feel good doing it as well, doing those tasks. And that's what I really liked about snow runner was it felt cohesive. It felt like, Oh, everything I'm doing serves a purpose, right? So when they announced last year, hey, we're doing a new game. We're going to make a fourth game called Expeditions. I was really, 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 really excited. So excited that as soon as it got announced of the release date, I went, okay, this is going to come out in March. Uh, we're going to make a game of the month for March. And so that's what I did. And luckily, because they have multiple editions and the way the gaming industry works is they try to milk uh, money out of us as much as possible. I said, look, I'm going to buy the Supreme Edition because I want to buy all the DLC for these games. I really like these games. I love the DLC. I'm going to play it. They had an incentive of, well, if you buy the one year pass game version or the Supreme Edition version, like the highest tier you can get early access to play the video game before everyone who just buys the normal version. Normal version is 30, 40 bucks. Uh, the Supreme edition was about 60, $70. And I went, you know what? I'm just going to buy the Supreme edition. So I did, and I got access to it on March 1st. So I've been streaming it for a good two weeks now and pretty much almost every day, and just having a blast. I have over 35, almost nearly 40 hours in that game, and it has been so much fun. It has been a little bit of an issue within the SnowRunner community, because that game, SnowRunner, kind of really deals with hauling vehicles, pulling trailers and tractors, and, you know, um, getting stuff behind your big massive truck and pulling it from point A to point B. But Expeditions actually focuses on the scouting uh, stuff, which is actually what I actually really like more in the SnowRunner game. And if you don't know what scouting is, it's basically exploring. You're taking a much smaller vehicle like an SUV or a Jeep or a big truck, uh, not a massive, you know, the 18 wheeler type of truck, you're taking a four by four off roading vehicle and going exploring. And with SnowRunner, the big thing with the maps or the regions, you're dealing with a lot of small rural towns, but in expeditions, you're dealing with a lot of just empty environment. Not bad empty, I'm talking about just the wilderness. There is nothing out there. No, uh, no um, buildings or roads or street signs or anything, guardrails, nothing. You are just driving in the wilderness. And that's what I really, really enjoy about expeditions. Now, the one thing with expeditions is it's not just geared to the scouting and exploring stuff. It's also incorporating a lot of devices like a cargo drone uh, where you're exploring or a metal detector 
or um, a sonar so that you can kind of uh, understand how deep a river is so that maybe you can ford it or maybe you have to go around depending on the depth of the water. So there's a lot more emphasis on the scouting, exploring, and using the devices, which the devices are a little bit rough. I have been having a larger issue with those devices and learning how to work with them instead of having them work against me because I have had definitely several times where I'm just going, what am I doing? How is this not working the way that I feel like like it should? And because it is wilderness, I am flipping my car over, which is a big, big, big issue, and not being able to flip myself back back over kind of like my tortoise rex every once in a while he gets really antsy and he'll climb up on something and flip himself over on a shell and because he's a little tiny baby tortoise and his legs aren't uh, um, high enough or there's no uh, environment where there's good hills for him to latch onto something and flip himself back over it's kind of like that with me in expeditions my truck has nowhere to winch in the arizona region and Again, I I will nitpick a few things with this game, or not even nitpick, mainly criticize, and criticize with the intent of, I hope it does get better, because I am enjoying this, but these are some bigger issues that need to be talked about. The flipping over the cars where there's nothing you can do, running out of gas, especially with the Scout vehicles where your gas tank is just too small, that's a huge issue. And then the regions, the regions are, there's only two. You have Arizona and the Carpathian Mountains. Arizona, where you're in the Grand Canyon, which is kind of cool, is just desert and rocks and cliffs. That's all it is. You have some cactus and a few trees here and there, but it is mostly completely deserted. And so there's no winch points. And again, one of the things that you're supposed to rely on is the devices. And one of the devices that they provide for you is anchor points. Anchor points are little tiny disks that you can smack into the ground and create a winch point anywhere within the you know various size circle of your vehicle. So within about, I'd say, you know, three to five. 10 meters from your vehicle's circumference is basically a place that you can place a uh, disc in the ground, which is an anchor point that you can winch to. The thing is, here's the catch. You have to be able to buy it first. You have to plan ahead a little bit. And that's where it gets really difficult for me (laughs) when I am trying to figure out, okay, crap, what am I doing? How am I doing this? Um, you get a lot of money from selling vehicles, finding parts in the environment that you can sell back at the end of your expedition, uh, or, you know, accomplishing missions, you'll get money. When you buy an anchor point or something that is called a jack screw, a jack screw is basically another way to flip your vehicle over. But this, the jack screw, it's almost like a debug menu item. It really doesn't feel like this should be an item in the game. It feels like this is a developer item (laughs) because basically what it does is you you buy the jack screws or you can find them in little airdrops that, you know, show up around the map and you come across them and you can put them in your inventory. So when you're driving around and you hit a, a rock and it flips your vehicle over and you go, crap, I have no anchor points. I have nothing to, you know, find and and figure out what's going on. You can use the jack screw and the jack screw will basically allow you to flip your car on the um, with the wheels and put it and place it again in a, you know, a circle around where you are in the map. But it is done in such a weird way where your car turns translucent green And the circle has green, yellow, and red, where it's like, hey, you know, the elevation is a little bit wonky. It's a little bit off kilter. Make sure you place your vehicle. But it just, it feels very developer friendly, not very polished in a way that it makes it look like there's some sort of animation that happens where your car like gets rotated or anything. No, it's just a straight, you know, single frame clip and 
bam, done. You're back on your wheels. It's almost like a reset button in a way. That's kind of what it feels like. So it has been definitely a learning curve with that game and an allowance for this is a budget title. And that's kind of what I've been talking about over the course of the streams. When people are watching, I see people really go, well, what should I, uh, should I play snow runner or should I play expeditions? And the people who jump into these conversations, most of the time will say, Oh, expeditions is bad because you know, it feels like it's unfinished or blah, blah, blah. Just like I was talking about with the Jack screw, with the developer feeling towards it. And yes, there is definitely some of that there, but we have to remember it's a budget title. It is a title that you can't really do much with, uh, given the constraints of how much they're selling it for right out of the gate. If you wanted to buy the game day of release without going to a third party seller site like Green Man Gaming or CD Keys, it's 40 bucks. It's a $40 game, which all new games are retailing, retailing for $70 now. So you're getting almost half off of the game right off the bat. Uh, I got it, or at least the, the base version of the game is $30 uh, for the regular version on release day instead of spending 60 or 70 bucks. So again, right there tells you everything you need to know about how much this game is, you know, drop down in price. And when you have those budgetary restraints on the selling of the product, you're going to have to expect that there's going to be a little less of that product there. And I'm okay with that. Like I said, the, the game is more about exploring the wilderness, not hauling stuff in a city or a, a town. And I'm having a blast with it. There are some new mechanics as well, like the tire pressure system. Like I said, you drive around in Arizona and the Grand Canyon and the Carpathian Mountains, where there's a lot of rocky surfaces. When you're off-roading, you need to have your tire pressure be calibrated properly so that your tires, A, either don't pop on rocks and sharp points, but also have a little bit more grip so that they don't just spin right off of something. So you can lower the tire pressure and you can do that in this game. It's just as simple as hitting the down, uh, the, the down on the D pad to be able to bring up the menu system. And you have three options. You can have your normal tire pressure reduced or very low tire pressure, very low tire pressure and reduced tire pressure give you more grip when you're in very rocky surfaces but it comes at the expense of removing or, or taking away more of your gas. You're going to use more fuel when your tire pressure is low. So there's a give and take with it. And I think that's excellent. I think that's a really interesting and good mechanic. And oh my gosh, it really, really helps. Every once in a while, when I get into an area where I'm like, can I do this? I go, oh, that's right. Tire pressure. I drop it to reduced or low, depending on the circumstances. And almost immediately, I can get myself up and over that rock or down a mountain cliff, whatever it is. So it's it's really, really cool. I love it. Oh, man. So those are the two games that I've been playing kind of pretty much for the last several weeks here uh, since at least uh, March. And now I'm going to talk about basically what I'm looking forward to over the next couple of weeks here, because 2023 was an incredible year for release of new video games. Most of them weren't really up my alley, and that's okay. But I do recognize how many stinking games came out in 2024. It's unbelievable or sorry, 2023. 2024 is going to be a much different year. I think we are going to have a very, very big contrast. I think we're going to basically be back into 2014. I don't know if you remember 2014 release schedule, but 2013 was the last year of regular um, generation of consoles of Xbox 360 and PS3. 2014 
Like right at the end of 2013, we got the new Xbox One and PS4. And with that change, we saw developers trying to move on to that new architecture and nothing came out. There was several games, several big games that came out, and that was pretty much it. So it was even a struggle to kind of figure out what we wanted to put up as game of the year that year because really nothing was very good there was only like a handful of titles and obviously those are going to be game of the year but it was actually kind of hard to fill out a top 10 list it was so hard to find 10 video games that were considered the best of the best because there was just very little to choose from 2020 2021 2022 were all kind of the same thing 2023 was the first year where it went, oh, video games are back, baby, right? But then this year, I think we're back into that because it took so long for everyone. Everyone delayed everything because of the pandemic and all that stuff. And then delays upon delays that everything came out in 2023. And now all the big major studios are now just starting to work on their next big game and games are taking way too long they have a way too big of a scope at this point triple a studios are putting out one game every five to seven years instead of three to four every year it's just it's nuts the video game industry is in a real bad spot right now it's not all doom and gloom though i'm just saying that 2024 is going to be a drought year I can already see the signs. Uh, January, February, and March, we've had one to two games that were solid, and that's about it. And most of them have been remasters, right? Tomb Raider uh, 1, 2, and 3 remastered. Dark Forces remastered. Uh, We have the Star Wars Battlefront collection from Aspire that just came out, which apparently is really awful. Uh, There's three big games right now, and they're all just remasters or remakes or whatever, right? Uh, Nintendo is basically doing the same thing. They barely put out back in late November, the Super Mario RPG uh, remake. And then they've got Paper Mario RPG or Paper Mario Thousand Year Door uh, remake and a couple other remakes as well. Um, I just, oh, oh, Donkey Kong Mario versus Donkey Kong remake just came out a couple, what, last month, I believe. So there's a lot of remakes coming out, not a whole lot of new IPs, new franchises, new sequels, whatever it is. There's not a lot coming out. So I think 2024 is going to be a pretty big drought year as well. I think we're going to get like a handful of games that are going to be considered the great ones. But I think other than three to four titles, I think everything else is going to be very big personal preferences for people for game of the year. I can already tell Tomb Raider 1, 2, 3 Remastered is definitely going to be in my top 10 this year because not only am I having a blast with it, it's also probably going to be, you know, just one of those games where it's like, hey, uh, that was really all that came out. Expeditions probably will be one as well. I'm calling it in early March. Expeditions and Tomb Raider 1, 2, 3 Remastered are probably going to be in my top 10. Mark it down if you want. So... What am I looking forward to since this year is probably going to be such a big drought? Well, there's a couple things. And this month alone has a few little things that I'm kind of really, really, really looking forward to. Just a couple days ago, uh, Digital Eclipse, who made The Making of Karataka, which I started on January 1st, I believe. Uh, It's basically a digital documentary with allowing you to play some demos from, um, oh, I'm going to forget his name now, Uh, but the guy who created Prince of Persia and Karataka, they did a documentary and kind of pulled out some old prototypes and also remastered or remade in their own vision these smaller, you know, Commodore 64, Atari 5200 video games Uh, or Amiga video games. And it was just really, really interesting. Digital Eclipse has a lot of pedigree. They also made the Atari 50 collection, which not only was another kind of collection that was really, really well done with the idea of preserving and presenting video games in a more classic format and more prestigious format, but it also gave us 
a fully fledged, real, full, perfect Atari Jaguar emulator, which we never had before. Atari Jaguar is known for being really hard to emulate because there was not a whole lot of documentation made available. So everyone who did Atari Jaguar emulation, it was always very, very spotty. But I can't remember the guy's name, but he basically worked on Atari and did the Atari Jaguar emulator for that collection. And Atari allowed him to release it as a standalone emulator to preserve so that the community can actually preserve all the Atari games, the Jaguar games, sorry. And the Atari 50 collection is responsible for that. So I can't think digital eclipse and <laughs> enough for that and then they also did the tmnt cowabunga collection so they're, they're kind of known for collections and uh, preserving video games in a really interesting format and they did a new one called llama soft a jeff minter story which is basically um an expose, a, you know, informational dump about Jeff Minter, who is really into llamas. I think he's a llama farmer and most of his video games deal with llamas <laughs> and uh, the, because his name or his company name is Llamasoft. And then also a really trippy, acidy based art style. It's always, you know, a RGB uh, rainbow effect on pretty much everything he does. And I remember they would always talk about him on Giant Bomb because they really liked Tempest. Tempest 2000 on the Atari Jaguar, right? And... When he released on the Xbox 360, Space Giraffe. I remember there was a few people who were losing their minds over Space Giraffe. It was an Xbox 360 arcade game. And I bought it sight unseen because I was listening to these podcasters or these uh, video games media articles where it was just like, dude, everyone needs to buy this new Jeff Mentor game like Jeff Mentor is the greatest. And it was always kind of weird because I never really understood who he was. They would just talk about him in this reverence without explaining kind of his background or the games he worked on or whatever. So when I bought that Space Giraffe game, it's kind of like an acid trip. Uh, I did not enjoy it at all. I really, really felt burned by it. So I never really paid much attention to Jeff Minter after that for a while. But he does have this new documentary, you know, by Digital Eclipse. They did such a good make, uh, good job making the making of Karataka, the Atari 52 collection or 50 collection, TMNT, Cowabunga. And they also did the remake of Medieval or medieval on the PlayStation 4, that it's like, wow, okay, I'll give these guys a chance. They, they, they earn my money. So I'm looking forward to that. It just dropped a couple of days ago. I just haven't picked it up yet. Another game that I'm really, really looking forward to is Tropico VR. I just found out about this last night. Tropico VR is an interesting one. I love the Tropico series. Tropico is a simulation city builder in the same, uh, same vein as SimCity, but it's set in a tropical island area where you play. It's basically like Cuba without saying it's Cuba. You play as, quote unquote, the dictator. <laughs> and the dictator sounds and looks exactly like Castro. And you have an advisor, your like right hand guy named Penultimo. And basically what you do is you have these scenarios of levels that you need to build up your city island and make it flourish, right? You have an import export business, you uh, build farms for the different types of things you want to import and export uh, or, or export to other countries. You're doing, um, uh, political relations, you know, with other countries to barter and stuff like that, uh, get tourism on board. And then you're also dealing with, you know, rebels and, and coups and things like that, as well as building cities for your citizens to live in, uh, and towns and roads. Again, if you played any Sim City game before or City Skylines or any of that, you know exactly what this game is. And that's what it is just in a tropical setting. Now, 
the th- interesting thing that I learned about tr- Tropico VR is it's Tropico in virtual reality, but it's the fourth game in the series. And the fourth game in the series came out on the Xbox 360 in 2011. It's a 13 year old game that they're porting into VR. And I'm not sure why they're doing it with four and not five or six, like or seven. Like, why don't they just make Tropco seven and add add a VR element? I'm not really sure. Maybe because it's coming out on the Oculus Quest exclusively, I believe. And so you need something old, something familiar, something kind of just drop VR into and kind of hope it works. I'm wary of it. But also, I have the best memories of 4. The reason why is because when I played 4, it was at a very tough point in my life. When Tropico 4 came into my life, it was right after I lost my, you know, my video game store. And I was really down and out. I lost my entire video game collection. The business crumbled and we had to shut down. And it was just a really, really rough time in my life. And so I would spend every day alone up in the mountains, you know, several hours away from my friends and family by myself, just hold up in my house and play video games or watch movies. And (laughs) Tropic 04 was one of those times where I would stay up until five or six o'clock in the morning and just play that game. So I dumped dozens and dozens of hours into that game and i had a blast with it so kind of coming back to it with a vr version i'm really interested about but like i said i'm tempering my expectations i'm really questioning why it's locked the headset of the oculus quest and then also why is it tropico 4 and not 5 or 6 like something a little bit new or something that i haven't dropped so many hours into However, since that was so long ago, I don't really remember a lot of the mission types or the storylines or anything. And it is, does seem like a good, you know, kind of a little bit of a time waster. So as long as it's priced accordingly, I, I think I'm going to have a lot of fun with it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Then we come to the backlog or I call the library of games, which is basically saying, all right. There's some games that I do want to get to at some point. Uh, not new; They might be new games. They might be old games. It's just something that I have on my backlog, right? Ape Escape 2 is one of those games. And the reason why is because a couple months ago, I played through Ape Escape 1 with one of the viewers, Beetle Hero 420. And we had such a fun time. He was such a big proponent of really wanting to uh, guide me through that game that I just had so much fun with it. I did not expect to have so much fun with Ape Escape 1. So after we finished Ape Escape 1, we moved on to the PS2 and did Ape Escape 2. However, since he was going through a transition period of moving that he just didn't have time to, you know, watch the streams. And I said, look, dude, hey, you're like the biggest guy, uh, like the biggest um, advocator for this game. And I'm having so much fun talking to you while we play through this game together that I can wait. You let me know when you come back and you're ready to play some more Ape Escape 2 and I'll I'll uh, I'll play it for you. And so I've been kind of just waiting on that. And he finally came back. He's kind of moved in, settled down a little bit. And we're going to play some Ape Escape Escape 2 pretty soon here. And I'm just, I'm floored. I'm excited. I'm ecstatic. I can't wait. It's going to be so much fun. Another game that I'm really looking forward to kind of getting on with is the Dark Forces Remastered games. Dark Forces Remastered is a game that I uh, started a couple weeks ago. And for one reason or another, I kind of just haven't picked it back up. Mostly due to the fact that not only is it a Doom clone type of game, it's built in, I believe, the same engine. The Is it the build engine? Uh, and... It is very much in the same vein as Doom, which I've never been into Doom games. But it's got a Star Wars, you know, um, 
filter on it basically and the storyline the voice acting everything in especially because it's a remaster version that came out last month it's really good looking the one main issue for the reason why i'm hesitant to go back to it is because some of the levels are very very hard to get through um there was a level on one of the last missions that i played where you basically have to go up and down these two sets of elevators and go through different levels on each elevator and clear everything out. And then you have to figure out that there's a poster on the wall that tells you, you need to set each elevator at a certain level, somehow get out and drop back in and get on top of each elevator so that you can run across and grab into another vent to get to this one very hard to get to location and these levels are very long and there is no save points so if you mess up i was in a level for 45 to 60 minutes and i died at the very end of it probably within about three minutes of completing the level and i died and had to do the entire thing over again in one stream and i was just like dude i just lost 50 ish minutes of progress i'm so tired <laughs> i don't want to play this again and so that definitely kind of tempered my expectations along with the fact that i did learn oh i'm nowhere near the end i'm not even halfway through that game and i've dropped like 10 hours into it mostly because i'm exploring i'm learning how to play those games because i never really got into them the only game that i did get into was wolfenstein 3d and that's a very 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 basic version of those games wolfenstein 3d is like there's no you know height there's no jumping there's it, it is just you are in corridors and rooms right fighting nazis and stuff like that so it is it is kind of a little bit crazy but man i'm having so much fun with that series and it's a blast so yeah I'm ready to kind of move forward and move on with that game. And hopefully I won't have too hard of a time. I'm thinking maybe that I can have a game guide, you know, on my tablet so that if I do get stuck, I can pull up and, and kind of find just again, kind of a point in the right direction. I've never been a fan of looking at walkthroughs or game guides. I am a fan of playing the game the way that it, you know, it's supposed to be experienced. But if I get stuck within, I'm, I'm trying to figure out like a kind of a good rule of thumb going, well, if I'm stuck for 15 minutes, then I think it's okay to look up a game guide and kind of look where I'm at in the level of progression and then just kind of get a sense of, okay, I need to go this way or that way. Because again, with, you know, um, uh, with dark forces in some of these games they don't tell you where to go at all it is just straight up you figure it out you are completely lost completely turned around and that's really hard to do when you're like that and i get like that every once in a while with video games where i usually have a pretty good sense of direction but with dark forces remastered and tomb raider 2 and 3 i've had very very big points in those games where i just went I'm completely 100% lost. I have no idea where I am, what I should be doing. And boy, oh boy, do I need some help. So that's kind of where I am at with uh, Dark Forces Remastered. I'm really looking forward to diving back into it. I just don't know when. I'm working on a schedule so that I can kind of have a better understanding of, hey, I want to do this or I want to do that. But that is some of the games I'm looking forward to playing over the course of the next couple of weeks here because there's not much else coming out, right? Like I said, there's only just a couple things in March that I'm looking forward to. Tropico is at the end of the month, like dead end of the month, like the 30th or 31st. Um, Llamasoft is a documentary, so there's not much to play there. It's more of a watching experience. And that will take several hours, you know, five, six hours or something like that over the course of a couple nights. 
And then uh, I always like finishing the podcast off with talking about the game of the month. Now, the game of the month for March 2024 is Expeditions, a Mud Runner game. And I kind of talked about that at the beginning of the podcast. So I'm not going to dive too much deeper into that, but I am having a blast with it. It's brought in a lot of new viewers, mostly because I think a lot of people want to kind of see what that game is. And there's not a whole lot of people playing it, which is a real bummer but it's brought in a lot of viewers to the channel and every single person who watches this channel and listens to me talk about video games i always really appreciate i'm not doing this for any other reason than to connect with others about video games and have fun talking about video games with people so um, i'm really happy that It is bringing new people into the channel and kind of giving them a sense of, hey, this guy plays this game and he also plays other games and he talks about video games and he podcasts and blah, 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 all that type of stuff, right? And then if you have any idea about what to suggest, I'm always taking suggestions for not just the streams themselves, but specifically right now, I'm talking about the game of the month. For April's game of the month, I don't have anything on the docket just yet. I don't even have an idea. I haven't even thought about it. So if you have any suggestions about what April's game of the month should be, let me know. Uh, Drop it in the Discord. You can always drop it in the suggestions of the Discord. Always looking there, always taking notes on it. It doesn't mean that your suggestion will get picked or that I will even, you know, uh, play it, but I am always willing to take a look at whatever game gets suggested. If it's something that is a multiplayer game, we might do that. I haven't um, figured out what I want to do with multiplayer, but I was talking about it on stream last night and saying, hey, look, I definitely do want to do a multiplayer night, whether it's once a week or once every two weeks. So like bi-monthly, I think that would be pretty interesting to do a multiplayer stream with the community and kind of, you know, say, hey, let's all get together and play something, whether it's the co-op of SnowRunner or Expeditions when Expeditions gets that update for co-op or whether it's a shooter, you know, or something like that, team-based shooter. I'm, I'm always down to play games with others as long as it's a game either that we all have and we can have fun or it's something that um, is one of those games that a lot of people will really be interested in. I don't want to just always do exactly what I want and what I want only. I want the community to have a say or at least a voice in, hey, game of the month should be something that we can all play together, whether that's me streaming it and then other people being able to talk about it during the stream and playing it on their own. That's kind of the general idea of game of the month is I want people in the community to all experience the game at the same time. So kind of like a book of the month club, like that's the whole idea behind game of the month, right? is we all play the same game together and can talk about it. And whether we're in certain areas or not, as long as we don't spoil it too much, you know, we can all say, oh yeah, remember that part? Oh, I had difficulty with it. Oh, you did? I didn't. I was able to breeze right through it. But man, remember this puzzle? Blah, blah, blah. That's kind of the idea behind Game of the Month. So I'm really excited. I'm really happy. I'm very, very um excited where this streaming venture is going is starting to become a bigger thing and how big it gets i don't know and i'm not really you know uh, dreaming uh, too big at this point this is more of a hobby and hopefully a little bit of a secondary income slash side gig that's really what this is right now but uh who knows if that will take off or not i'm not banking on it i'm certainly saying or I'm just saying I want to be able to play video games, uh, be an entertainer, because that's kind of one of my God-given gifts is being able to hang out and have fun and be entertaining for people and showing that, hey, we can, you know, we can be different (laughs) and have fun together. And so that's kind of really what I am kind of venturing forth with this streaming experience. And I hope you enjoy it as well. With that being said, this is the end of the podcast section, so I'll do a quick break here, and then we will play a little bit of 
Tomb Raider 3, but thank you so, so, so much for watching or listening to the podcast. You can always check out everything I do at gameordie.net. That's the website. And the website is definitely kind of going through some changes. I'm working on some stuff in the back end so that I can make it a little bit more refreshed. And the Discord is also another great way the community is starting to get built out a little bit. We're getting more and more members pretty much almost every couple of days, which is rad. One or two here or there. And I want to make it so that not only can we hang out and talk together on stream, but when we're off stream and I'm not streaming, we can talk together and, you know, come up with either ideas for the next game that to play or, you know, community events, giveaways as well are definitely something I have in the pipeline, but I am streaming. I do have a full-time job as well. I have a family that I need to take care of and a bunch of animals as well. So, um, if I don't get to one thing or another right away, that's the reason why, you know, life, real life always comes first, but the streaming is definitely a big part portion of my hobby of video games. And man, I love video games. That's really what all of this is about. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching, subscribing and all that type of stuff. It means the world to me that people are enjoying what I do. Until next time, until maybe next week or the week after, I'm not really sure if I'll record to, uh, next Sunday or not. I try to do every Sunday, but it just depends on if I have enough stuff to talk about. Uh, I feel like I've talked to death about Expeditions and uh, uh, Tomb Raider, so that that's pretty much why I skipped a week there, but... I'll be back in just a little bit with some Tomb Raider uh, 3, play that for a little bit, and then uh, do the evening stream, which will probably be a little bit more Tomb Raider, unless I figure out something else I want to do. But until then, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Hope you have a good rest of your Sunday, a good rest of your St. Patrick's Day, and I'll catch you on the next stream. All right, later.